Welcome to another Motorhome Matt podcast with me, Keith Gooden, and the expert... Motorhome Matt. Motorhome Matt Sims. <laughs> it's brought to you with thatleisureshop.com. OK, then. Today, we're talking about Campra. Don't know what it is? Stay listening to the end and you'll know all about it by the end. First of all, let's dive, Matt, into the news and a couple of things which are, are raising their head again. We've talked about them in the past. I remember a couple of, well, more than a couple of podcasts ago, I was talking about being in Exmouth last year and everybody rubbing along quite nicely, motorhomers and joggers and people with their families and dog walkers at Exmouth beachfront mm. and how some motorhomers used a couple of spaces overnight and, uh, you know, weren't stopping other people from parking. And it just all seemed so heavenly and wonderful. However, uh, the local press, Devon Live, have been highlighting a piece about Exmouth Council stopping van lifers from using an old lorry park, which appears to have some work done on it and will again be used as a lorry park. But uh, the council say the van lifers, the van lifers have got to go. Yep. First of July, they're all being told to move on. That's the deadline. Now, the thing is, van life are people who live in camper vans or motorhomes, aren't yep. they? For, for whatever reason. So yeah. are the council being unreasonable here? I mean, it seems that they've been down at Exmouth in this old uh, lorry park and everything seems to be, as they used to say, where I come from, hunky-dory. Hmm. There's no reason given as to why. It just says that the car park will be returned to its original use, which I suppose is back to a lorry park. But we do ask why they're being asked to move on uh, I actually hope to go down there and go and talk to some of the van lifers that are there living there and many have chosen to live there there was one lady in particular that you know for her that lifestyle wasn't a choice it was something that she you know found herself being faced with having lost her home and it was affordable way of living for her uh, and so that car park has been her home and her base and it's being taken away uh, so our plan is to go down and actually talk to some of those people. In fact, if you're one of them and you're listening, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to find out you know, why. what's your impression of what's going on. And also, uh, if you're one of the councillors or, or uh, are up on this story in Exmouth, we'd like to hear from you. And we will get in touch with the council and give them the opportunity to appear on a forthcoming podcast. So stand by on the uh, telephone switchboard at Exmouth uh, Council. Uh, <laughs> Some but, poor lady is yeah. really worried <laughs> that you're going to turn up. It's difficult, isn't it? Because councils have been under a lot of pressure over the last 10, 12 years mm. by having their government grants cut. And also with the expansion of colleges and universities and what have you. Uh, some cities, places like Bath, for instance, are finding it very difficult to balance the books because student accommodation... Yep. Multiple occupancy uh, houses don't pay any council tax. The That's landlords right. don't pay any and the students don't pay any because they're not permanent residents. So what councils find is that, you know, they're being squeezed both both ways. But it would be interesting to find out what the uh, the reasoning is down here in Exmouth. Is it financial or, or is somebody just complaining they don't want the van lifers there? Yeah. Well, as you say, it didn't seem to be causing any issue, although you were looking at the ones on the seafront. I was. Uh, so why? What's the issue? Why is this happening? Why is this changing for these folks? Yeah, absolutely. And also, um, let's go back to Dartmoor. We covered this in our Trespass episode a few weeks uh, ago about a landowner down there who's won a landmark uh, court judgment, uh, which basically says that from now on he can stop people, should he choose to do so, from um, camping on his land. He's also, it would appear, and some neighbouring landowner as well, uh, closed a car park in the area, which will add a lot of difficulty for people who would have parked up and then taken their camping gear uh, and walked to where they were going to be camping. Uh, and uh, some people are saying it's closing off uh, the whole of parts of the south of Dartmoor. Yeah, not even necessarily with their camping gear, just going for a walk. So this particular car park is, I think, in the southern bit of Dartmoor. Uh, and it now to get to it, you have to hike up a steep 1.7 mile path to get to this area of Dartmoor. Uh, and so for those with disabilities or limited mobility, this was a popular car park. It's only a small car park. I think it took four vehicles, uh, but it was a way they could get to this nat area of na outstanding natural beauty uh, and enjoy that bit of countryside. Well, that's now been cut off to them. Uh, and, and the other car park you mentioned, the gate to that was, was locked up and that was a car park capable of 
parking 15 cars I think so much bigger and that's been closed off as well so you know this story continues Alex Darwell is the chap that managed to get this case passed isn't he and you know what's happening on Dartmoor I mean it, I you know kind of said my tongue in my cheek our civil liberties are being taken away and you challenge that but what is happening here you know are our, our, is our ability to go exploring the countryside being hampered you know, as more and more of it gets purchased and bought up, then people have their own agenda as to what we can do with it. And, you know, whose right is it? I said, well, our access is being hampered, isn't it? But Dartmoor's a national park, though, with everything that entails. Does it mean we can have a national park but can't get to vast swathes of it? That's true. And, there, of course, there are two sides to this, aren't there? There's the consumer, the person that wants to go and explore this, and then there's the landowner. I had a great conversation with activist and campaigner Sarah Roberts. You can check it out on YouTube and Sarah brilliantly positioned both sides of the story the fact that you've got you know she loves to go off in her camper van and park up in a kind of wild camping spot if I dare to call it that and enjoy nature be that surfing or hiking or dog walk but equally the land that we're parked on is owned it's owned by somebody and you know we expand on this more in our trespass episode previously don't we so there are two sides to this and it there is a balance and we need to try and find it and at the moment it feels a little bit like the pendulum is swinging extremely to the one side and to the other you know three thousand people protested on Dartmoor and campaigned didn't they in a big march that was a huge response so I think there's strong feeling about it If it's strong feeling about people going out into the countryside, enjoying the countryside and getting all the benefits for mental health from that and people want to continue doing that and it raises the profile of that pastime, that has to be a good thing. Uh, So, you know, these news items in isolation may not be good news, but the fact that they're putting this pastime and this topic on the agenda, I think is a good thing. Yeah, and by the way, that court uh, ruling is being challenged with an appeal. And also, as I've mentioned before, the Labour Party have said if they uh, gain power in the general election, the latest that can be is, I think, November 2024, they will introduce a law which allows people to access places uh, in England, uh, national parks, uh, whether it's owned privately or not. Uh, the one thing that strikes me is it's got, as you were saying, the pendulum you know, has got to be swing one way or another. There's got to be a compromise here, surely. And just because you own a piece of land. We're not talking about your back garden here, are we? We're talking about vast areas of land which Mm. people have enjoyed and hopefully respected. Yes, you own it, but why close it off to everybody? That's what I don't understand. that's the question. And and this takes us on to what we're talking about today is CAMPRA, which is the Campaign for Real Airs. So an air is a campsite in or camping facility Uh, typically in France, they're in Spain as well. And it's a French word where you can park up with the landowner's permission. There might be a small charge uh, and you can park up and camp overnight. You're not allowed to get your tables and chairs and awning out. That's key. But many of them have some basic facilities where you can empty your toilet cassette, you can top up your water, you can empty your dirty water as well. And there is a small charge and there's this campaign group are, are campaigning for more of these facilities. So basic campsites really sometimes they're car parks they could be a farmer's field where motorhomes are welcome it is motorhomes and camper vans only not caravans Uh, and you're allowed to park up not set up an encampment but you can use the facilities and the landowner can make some money from it and it's done very open book Uh, and there's uh, this campaign group campra are a website campra.org and their aim and objective is to Uh, raise the awareness of these facilities and encourage landowners to introduce this kind of facility on their own land. I spoke with Carolyn from Campra at the recent Yorkshire Motorhome Show in in Harrogate and I started by asking why does Campra exist? So Carolyn tell me what are Campra's main aims and objectives? Our main aim, I think, is to get uh, airs throughout the UK, as they have in France and the rest of Europe. Um, And the way to do this, we would like, as one of our aims, is to get the government to change the law. So which law do you refer to? Right, the law that covers us at the moment is called the Caravan Sites Control and Development Act 1960. A mouthful. (laughs) A bit of a long mouthful, yes. Um, But it was set up at a time, obviously, when there were very, very few motorhomes on the road. 
um, they recognised in 1983 that it was never actually intended to apply to touring caravan sites but more to park homes and mobile sites but that hasn't made it any easier for us. Right I see. So why do we need more airs? We need airs really because there just aren't enough facilities for motorhomes in the UK. Uh, We get a lot of people wild camping where they shouldn't wild camp. We get a lot of problems from irresponsible owners. And if we can get more airs, then people will have more opportunity and more options. They don't always want to go to campsites. And campsites are mostly closed between October and April anyway. So uh, where do we go for the rest of the time? And bear in mind, there's 82% of us travel all year round. Is it really 82%? At, uh, we did a survey at Camper in 2020, and that was the figure that we came from that. 82% travel all year round. That's brilliant, isn't it? Wow, yeah. great. Well, I'm one of them, and so are you. I am, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and currently, how many airs are there in the UK? Do you know? There are just over 200 altogether, and Camper have been involved in setting up around 120 of those right so growing fast then growing fast given that we've only been going for two and a half years yes but how many are there on the continent do you know there's around about 13 and a half thousand altogether in in europe Um, there's over 5,000 i think in france Um, and a lot of those in fact about half of those belong to or are operated in association with campsites And of course in this country we have a lot of problems because campsites think we're taking their business, which of course we aren't. But you are, you're kind of, if I stay with you, the campsite leaves out, surely? No, because I wouldn't stay on a campsite anyway. Oh, I see. Right, OK. <laughs> so I would just move on somewhere else where I could stay overnight. Um, but it's, you know, it's this thing, like it's like saying that you can't open a five-star hotel because we've got a bed and breakfast place in this town. Different markets. Yeah cater for different consumers so it's the same with airs and campsites. So would you say then you're targeting more people who like to wild camp so off grid and and possibly trespass is that what you're trying to stop? (laughs) We're trying to stop irresponsible camping we don't like to call it wild camping because we say we don't camp we actually park. Mm -hmm. Camping to us involves having um, tables, chairs, all your equipment out whereas what we tend to do is just park overnight with nothing outside of the um, the vehicle and of course we would never never advocate breaking the law. Of course not but you the air has some facilities for the motorhomer doesn't it so toilet emptying fresh water perhaps? Not necessarily. Um, okay. Even in Europe, airs vary from just a couple of spaces in a local um, car park, whether it's in a village or a town, to full-blown, all singing, all dancing, showers, Wi-Fi, hook up, the lot. Right, um, okay. So there is a huge variation in, right. in airs. Yeah. So we've got Eddie here as well, he's a director of Campra. Now, Eddie, we're going to slow the tape down so people can understand you. <laughs> I will. I'll keep my Geordie accent. You know. A good Geordie accent coming at you now. So... Do you deal with a lot with the council side yep. of things, don't you? Are, are the councils generally receptive to somebody coming to them saying, we want to set up an air in our hometown? They're an absolute mixed bag. Some are absolutely brilliant. And you go to completely the opposite end of the scale, where they'll throw everything at you to try and prevent you. Uh, I don't know why, whether they just don't want to support them or they don't want us there. But at least they're mixed. So we're getting somewhere, and I'm quite happy with that. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the financials for a, an air owner, of how, you know, how that works and what they can expect to earn? Do you want to answer that, Eddie? Um, it, that depends how many customers they're going to get through the door. What Camper say is, in France, because we're trying to emulate the same as France, uh, they're from free, which are usually municipal ones, and we say £5 for parking if it's a private one, because it's got to be paid for, mm-hmm. to £10 if it's got waste and water with it as well. So if you work that out, how many motorhomes you would get per night over a given period of time, you will end up with a figure that you, you should come out with. But obviously it could be less in winter and better in the, in the busier season. There is uh, worked out on camera exact figures for you, rough figures around that, and uh, I encourage anyone to have a look at that. So tell me about your experience of the site. You were telling me earlier about a site, an air in France. Tell yeah. me the numbers. The, that, front, that one in France, which was, um, they had 180 spaces. Um, and they had averaged 100 motorhomes. You could stay on the air, and that included uh, waste, water, and electricity, 
during the day free of charge or you could stay overnight and it was 12 euros for the night that included everything and they told me they averaged about a hundred motorhomes per night now if you half that figure or even quartered it that's a fantastic amount of money but then instead of multiplying it by 12 multiply it by 40 five pounds or 45 euros per night mm -hmm. and then see the figure you get out it's an enormous amount of money and of course these people in the motems then go and spend money in the local economy don't they they spend an awful lot of money and they're pretty well healed most motor homeowners up and they visit france there are thousands of brits who visit france why don't they stay here and brexit has given them the opportunity to stay here because they can only stay in france and the continent for three months now yeah. So let's get the airs built here and let's keep them here. Yeah, and keep some money in this country yeah. as well. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, quite. So, Carolyn, how do people book an air? We've had some lots of people asking us this after kind of discussing it in recent podcasts. And they're not the easiest thing to find and book, are they? In fact, can you even book one? You aren't actually supposed to be able to book an air, at least that's the way that it tends to work in France. Here in the UK we recognise it's a little bit different because you can't just turn around and go to the next one if that one happens to be full. So what we suggest is that people contact the owners of the airs up to 24 hours in advance and they will then know whether they have got space. Um, most air owners will actually ask you for either full payment or a deposit and that's because unfortunately they get a lot of no-shows. And how can you find the airs then? What is there a website or an app? You can find them on our own website, which is www.campra.org.uk, and you can also find them on Search for Sites. If you look on the main page of Search for Sites, on the right-hand side, there is our Campra logo. If you click on the logo, it takes you di directly to our site. If you click on the link underneath the logo, it will take you to the Campra airs. So once you're on a Campra air kind of listing you then contact them directly is that right that's right yes um, you can put yourself on to search for sites that's not difficult or, or we can help you do it um, search for sites obviously is just a, an organization whereby you can locate sites but it always has the contact details on for the owners of the airs and then you just ring and, and follow their booking procedure if they have one brilliant thank you that's great now for someone listening who has maybe got some land or is passionate about having an air in their hometown, they can get involved with you, can't they, via your website and via your Facebook page, which is very active. Uh, it's 30-odd thousand people on the Facebook group, isn't it? Uh, I'm part of it as well. But how can they get involved with you and what tools can you give them to help them campaign to maybe start an air in their own home city? Um, in terms of getting airs started, all you need to do is to identify a suitable piece of land and then contact us and we'll do the rest. Um, obviously, you should speak to the owner of the land first because they may not actually want it to be an air. But, <laughs> um, but uh, mostly the best way that you can get involved is to sort of lobby proactively but always to be polite and courteous. Don't protest, don't uh, petition. Um, and get involved with um, the campaigns that we have locally. Um, there's loads of information on our website. We've got templates for letters, mm. emails, um, and if you're stuck, just email Campra and we will help yeah. you out. It's and the templates are really useful as well, aren't they? They're very useful. Yes, um, they're also reasonably good English now. Yeah. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't let Eddie write them? No, I wrote them. <laughs> or should I say I rewrote them? <laughs> Brilliant. So um, that's fantastic. So when people approach the council, have they even heard of an air or is this a completely new word for them? It's <laughs> For a lot of councils, it is a completely new word. They've never even heard of it. And let's face it, most of them don't even know what a motorhome is. So, no, true. so you know, it, it is down to sort of explaining to them what we require, which is basically somewhere safe to stop overnight and the occasional facility because you don't need to have waste facilities on every single air that you that they create um, and really just sort of explain to them the benefits that they can derive in terms of local income for businesses but also for the council because if they're charging you know five or ten pound a night for a car park which is otherwise empty overnight then it, park and rides yeah but if a council own a piece of land and you want them to make it into an air who's going to run it the council haven't got the resource they don't need to run it. 
why, why do they need to run it? It is literally just dedicated motorhome parking. And one of these, the things about the resources here is that if they change their traffic regulation orders to allow sleeping in vehicles overnight, because many of them will allow you to park for 72 hours, but you can't sleep, um, then they can charge money for that. They can charge five, ten pounds a night f f to be able to stay over there. That will bring them income in, and if they then enforce that for a short period, so people who don't pay get fined, that will bring more money in, and the word will soon get around that they can't just park wherever they like, and the councils will start to earn money from it. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today and for coming up to the show. It's been great to meet you both. Eddie, I'd love to say I loved what you said, but I didn't understand a word of it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both. Carolyn, thank you. Eddie, thank you too. So that was Carolyn from Camper. Seems like a very good idea, sort of a sort of uh, midway what, what we've been talking about. It's not the, the whole singing and dancing campsite, is it? It's what the French have been doing. You mustn't leave a mark. You can't get your awning out. You can't have a barbecue. But it gives that vital stay over, doesn't it? That's right. And it's a great way of, of enabling people with a motor or camper van to visit the places they want to go. Uh, and, you know, they're often these places could be in beautiful locations and they're there with the landowner's permission. That's that's the key. Uh, and it's open book. You know, and, and there might be a small charge and normally there is. But trying to encourage councils. We just haven't wired this up in our heads, have we? Yeah, in Bristol, we have a campsite in the middle of the city at Baltic Wharf. It's a very popular, well-known campsite, and it's closing. It's being built on. There is no viable alternative at the moment being presented. Uh, and, in, in fact, an alternative was rejected. Michael Gove rejected on the grounds of it being a floodplain and therefore unsafe. So Bristol Centre has nowhere that's an official campsite. So there is an opportunity, I think, within our own home city here in Bristol for an air. So if you are a landowner listening to this, then I would encourage you to get in touch with Campra. There will be an opportunity, I'm sure, for you to set up somewhere where you can convert you know, a handy piece of land into an income stream. Yeah, and Bristol Caravans, for instance, you were talking to them uh, in the last few podcasts, and they've got a little forest area, haven't they? They have. They have what's called a CL, um, so that's a caravan and motorhome club um, certified location, where you don't need planning permission for that, uh, and it's just five uh, pitches that motorhomes can camp or caravans can stay, uh, and it's their own private land. And again, you book in with them, uh, and you know that's a handy place if you want a service done as well. And would an air be like that? Uh, an air, it could be like that. That is a campsite, so a very established campsite, you know, in the traditional sense. The difference is it's restricted to just five pitches, and therefore doesn't need planning permission. And a camper air, as, as they describe it, is much more of a car park. Right, I'm with you. Well, I hope that's uh, helped you. And uh, do uh, get uh, in touch with camper if you want to know more. Can we just uh, repeat their website again? Yeah, it's camper.org.uk And join the Facebook group as well. It's a really active Facebook group. I think there's over 30,000 people in it. It's incredible. It's the Motorhome Matt podcast with me, Keith Gooden, and Motorhome Matt Sims, our expert. It's the audience Q&A, where you ask the questions and Matt gives the answers. Jack's been in touch. Hi, guys. I uh, love the podcast. My name's Jack, um, and I'm 29 years old, and my partner's 28, and we would love to get into motorhoming, caravanning, campervanning, in particular, campervanning. Um, we just wondered if you could give us some advice on the best way to get into that industry, because uh, obviously, as you guys know and discuss a lot, it is very expensive. Um, so we've been looking at some kind of camper vans that might be up to 20 years old with up to maybe 100,000 miles, if not more, on the clock. Um, do you have any advice on the kind of uh, minimum age you would want from your motorhome and a maximum mileage to look out for? Uh, or is it all about service history and that kind of thing? Uh, we'd love any advice. Thank you. So Jack says he wants to get into the industry, but he doesn't mean work in it. He wants to buy a, a van. So his question is quite relevant. Mm. You know, what's 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 the best buying uh, map that you should go for? The age of the vehicle, the mileage of the vehicle, you know, what's in it? Where in your experience is the first place people should start looking? Yeah, well, one option is just buy a van 
and convert it yourself. That's probably the lowest cost route into it. It's going to need some research and expertise, perhaps, on your own part to spec it. But that would certainly be, I'd say, probably the lowest cost route in. And then it's about the van, and it's going as new as you can afford with as few miles on as, as possible. And yeah, as Jack says, service history is really important. You could buy a pre-converted camper van. Uh, one thing I would definitely look at on is the V5. Is it a motor caravan or is it a van with windows? Uh, that's really important because there are restrictions on speed. Uh, so a van with windows can only go 60 miles an hour on the motorway. Did you know that? I didn't know that, no. Yeah, it's true. I'll tell you something else about a van with windows I found out. I was using a council tip. I'm not going to say where, um, but I said, could I bring a van in here? He said, oh, no, mate, you've got to have a license to bring a van in. He said, mm -hmm. but I shouldn't be telling you this. If you have a van with windows, you don't need a license to use. And it's got to have seats in the back. Mm. Yeah, so our, our, we've got a sh VW shuttle, it's called. It's a minibus, basically. And it's branded up, and it has windows. And every time we go to the tip in it, because it, we you know, take our rubbish from home, uh, because it's branded, they assume it's a it's a work van, and they always look in the back and go, yep, the seats are in it. I once took the van with no seats in it and wasn't allowed in. And one of the guys said, but he's had to take the seats out to get the rubbish in. <laughs> <laughs> We'd moved house, I think, and we were disposing of stuff. But anyway, back to Jack in his camper van. Back to Jack. <laughs> we're with you, Jack, honest. Yeah. So uh, if you're going to buy a converted van, pre-converted van, uh, a VW one's going to carry a premium price. So I would look maybe at alternative brands, maybe Ford. Uh, there are other Vauxhall as well. They are always going to be a lower price than that, that VW badge on the front. Um and also who converted it. So if it's if it's a Volkswagen California or an Ocean, they are factory built by VW. They always carry a higher price. If it's a backstreet converter, if I call it that, so it could be someone that's doing five or six a year, um, that they are going to be a lower price. But again, look at the service history and get it inspected. So I've seen some really, really great conversions and some incredibly dangerous conversions as well. There are lots of regulations and uh, lots of best practices that you will have no idea about at this point so get an expert to go and look at it and get it inspected there's a thing called a habitation check a whole episode on that in the past you can go and check that out but go and get an independent engineer to go and have give it a, a check over and an inspection and tell you what they think of it and you can find them on the approved workshop scheme website or the mcea website and you'll find a mobile engineer and they'll charge I don't know 100 pounds or maybe a bit more just to go and look at it and give you their opinion um, so in terms of service history mileage you, you're looking at the right things you want as low a mileage as you can afford with as much service history as it can possibly present you with remember the van it's built on was was built to do 50,000 miles a year people forget that their pride and joy motorhome or camper van is a DPD van underneath. <laughs> it was built to deliver parcels. You know, that's why it was conceived. It then became a camper van or a motorhome. So high mileage isn't a bad thing. In fact, high mileage is often better than very, very low mileage. I think I mentioned before a motorhome that we brought in in part exchange and it was five years old with, I think, two and a half thousand miles on. And our workshop manager said, well, I wouldn't buy it. Hasn't, hasn't been anywhere. Hasn't been used enough. You know, and there's all sorts of problems that can come with lack of use. So you know, high mileage is fine if the service history is there. Make sure the cam belt has been done at 50,000, 60,000 miles. It should have had a cam belt. If it's done 120,000 miles, do you want to see the evidence that it's been done twice? If it hasn't got that evidence, get it done. Build that into the price. You know, budget a few hundred pounds or 500 pounds to get the cam belt and water pump done. But, I mean, Jack does sound like he's on a budget. What sort of money does he should he be looking at? Uh, oh, well, that's a really hard one. Double what it was five years ago, probably. You're you're going to be looking at ten thousand pounds plus easily for a decent conversion. We've got a a camper van for sale at the moment. Uh, I think it's about four years old. It's done ninety thousand miles. It's had the cam belt done. It's got a great service history. It's a really really nice conversion, I have to say, and that's thirty thousand plus pounds. Right. Uh, so you know you're. I'd say if your budget is 20,000, 25,000, you're in the market, definitely. There you go. I hope that's helped, Jack. And that's a good tip about them. That Originally, they are utility vehicles and, and they're built to stand the rigours of the roads. That's an advantage for you. Roger has asked, Matt, why do British motorhomes have electric hot plates 
in the hob? <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> it's true. Caravans and motorhomes that are built in Britain always have an electric hob and a gas hob. At least two gas hobs and one electric. It's a strange phenomenon. Do you know what I think it is? We're tight. Do you reckon? I reckon we love hooking up on the campsite and we like using their electric rather than our gas. <laughs> I think you might have a point there. I don't know why. I, I, is it about choice? I, I don't know. Are we fussy that we can't decide if we want electric hob or gas hob? I, I think we're just tight. Us Brits like saving the penny. There you go, Roger. That's your answer. <laughs> using the campsite's electricity instead of your own gas. If you're a British manufacturer listening to this, tell us why. Why do you do it? Auto Trail and Swift, Eldest, they all do it. Why? I suppose it, you know, it gives you the flexibility. I mean, if you're somewhere with electricity, you can use the electric, and if not, you can use your own gas. Well, it's very true, yeah. That's true. Yeah, that, and you save on gas, absolutely, yeah. And a lot of British-built motorhomes and caravans have ovens, whereas the Europeans one traditionally don't. Increasingly, they are putting ovens in them, but... Yeah, I don't know many people that have a full, in, you know, Sunday roast in their oh, motel. There'll be, the, there'll be some. <laughs> there'll be some. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. we've done it. I've had, a, I've had a roast chicken in my motel. It was great. It stank. <laughs> John's in Bristol. Hi, Matt. After leaving our motorhome in storage and thinking we'd turned everything off, we returned to find the leisure battery down to only six volts. This was only after a couple of weeks, and it was fully charged before we left it. Are we making some sort of beginner's mistake? Ooh, it depends what the motorhome was. Not necessarily, John, no. If it's a British-built motorhome, it's probably got a Sargent electric system in it. And if you've left that turned on, there's a little black button you must press. If you've left it turned on, then it's going to drain the battery, and it will drain it quite quickly. If you're not hooked up, then turn that button off, and you'll find the battery does survive it could be that the leisure battery has failed it's we call it dropping a cell um and if you've got an eggy smell in the van then then it's definitely the leisure battery has failed you sure probably <laughs> <laughs> unless you've been visiting it right <laughs> you've been on the pot noodle again haven't you <laughs> if there's an eggy smell in your van it's the battery Keith's about not dad <laughs> <laughs> so it could be the leisure battery's failed you can get it you can get it tested um i would take the leisure battery out take it home charge it on a decent battery charger uh, you can buy maypole sell we sell them in the shop at that leisure shop.com you can buy a reconditioner charger and it will put a very clever charge rate into the battery and hopefully you could bring it back to life and you can see what's going on but if the battery doesn't hold a charge you need a new battery yeah but i mean if it doesn't hold a charge after these few weeks do you think that that's a problem or don't you just Take take the uh, the terminals it, off and just and just leave it when you put it in storage. That's, yeah, that's you can do that. That's a good idea. I mean, it, the battery should hold a charge longer than a few weeks. Something is going wrong. There's a drain, a uh, parasitic drain is going on somewhere. You can disconnect the leisure battery. Uh, you can disconnect the starter battery as well. But if you've got a tracker on it or an alarm, none of that's going to function anymore. So all these things need to be considered. There you go. You've learned a lot today, haven't you, here on the Motorhome Matt podcast. So uh, what you should do is hop over to our YouTube site where you can see a lot of in-depth interviews. We use bits and pieces of them here, not always the whole interviews. And you can also look around some motorhomes and see some things being installed and maybe see some of the things that uh, uh, tickle your fancy as far as accessories are concerned. How... Do people stay in touch with us? I'm still stuck on tickling your fancy. <laughs> back off, baby. <laughs> Get back to your pop noodle. You can get in touch with us at motorhomemat.co.uk forward slash ask Matt, where you can ask a question or send us a comment. We'd love you to record it. Just hit the orange button and record your question. Tell us where you are. We love knowing where our listeners are in the country. Or you can fill out a form and press submit. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. And as Keith says, you'll find us on YouTube, Motorhome Matt. Make sure you click subscribe and click the bell. And then the gods of YouTube will tell you when we release new content. 